AMD have really turned up the wick for Ryzen 7000. These things are hot and they're brutally fast. Our clock speeds are far and above any other Ryzen CPUs that we've seen previously, and the multi-threaded performance is just insane. I mean, even just physically, we're looking at very different CPUs this time around. These are not compatible with previous AM4 motherboards. Basically, it's a complete platform reset, if you didn't know that already, with the new platform being called AM5. So new socket, new heat spreader, new CPU design, there are no pins on the bottom of the CPU anymore, and the installation is now very similar to Intel. That also means that we'll be avoiding situations like this in the future with the new socket design, and it also means that you won't be breaking any pins on the bottom of a Ryzen CPU anymore. So we've got four CPUs in the new lineup to kick things off. We've got the 7600X, 7700X, 7900X, and 7950X. Nothing out of the ordinary in terms of core counts or the naming scheme compared to the previous generations, and today we're checking out the 8 Core 7700X and the 16 Core 7950X. What is really out of the ordinary though is AMD's approach to power and temperatures. This is the new 8 Core 7700X in Cinebench, and yeah, it just happily sits between 90 and 95 degrees C. Same for the 7950X. I out of the box, it pulls around 230 watts and also sits around 95C at full load. Now, don't get me wrong, the performance is absolutely just ballistic on these new CPUs when it comes to multi-threaded performance. We'll get to that in a second, don't worry. But surely we have to just take a moment and discuss this just massive shift in approach from AMD. I mean, this is just completely different to what they've done previously. And I don't think many customers will actually be expecting this. The test bench, believe it or not, has a 360 mil liquid cooler at full fan speed, full pump speed, and the room ambient temperature is sitting around just 21 degrees. So it's not a cooling problem. It's also not a broken motherboard or bio problem or anything like that. Actually, according to AMD, these kind of temperatures are intended. Their new CPUs will actually pull as much power as they can before hitting that 95 degree temperature target, also known as TJ Maxx. In other words, the new CPUs will purposely run at that temperature to allow for more power draw, higher clock speeds, and more performance. The goal here is to make use of all of that thermal headroom that's available, every single drop of it, because in their eyes, that's performance that they're leaving on the table. Just to be totally clear here, no matter what cooling solution you use, whether it's a small air cooler or a 360mm AIO on an open bench at full speed, which is what I've used, full CPU load will always have Ryzen 7000 CPUs around that 95 degree target. So AMD are confident that those temperatures are safe. You know, you can run a Ryzen 7000 CPU all day long at 95 degrees C and you won't have any problems. And of course, you know, this makes more sense when you're looking at laptops and gaming devices like consoles and uh, handhelds and phones even, you know, they run at these temperatures a lot and it's almost just like considered normal. It's just that when we get to the desktop side of things that 95 degrees C is kind of uncomfortable to look at and experience and especially if you're a newbie PC builder and you see 95 degrees in a stress test or something like that I can't imagine the amount of headaches and just troubleshooting that is going to cause people who don't know that that's kind of the intended behavior especially when your PC is like screaming at you with the fans going full blast that's just the experience that I had with my test bench as well. Most motherboard fan curves are kind of set up to max out around the 80 degree mark, which for these CPUs means that even in kind of light and bursty workloads, your CPU cooler fans are going to be absolutely screaming. So that's the bad side of it, but the good side of milking this much thermal and power headroom is of course the performance. By squeezing every last drop out of Ryzen 7000, AMD have been able to achieve extremely high clock speeds compared to their previous generation. The new 79 50X settles all 16 cores to a whopping 5.1 gigahertz at full load in Cinebench R23. Again, that's all 16 cores. That's around 1.3 gigahertz above the 5950X from last generation. Obviously, most of that is due to the incredible work they've done with the new silicon, but I mean, chugging back an extra 100 watts also helps a lot too. The 8 core 7700X then has pretty much the same behavior, uh, all core frequency around that 5 to 5.1 gigahertz mark, package power exceeding 140 watts, and sitting around 95 degrees. A big change from Ryzen generations of the previous years for sure, which basically just sipped on power and were applauded for their low power consumption. Now, don't get it twisted. The new CPUs are still more power efficient than the previous generation. It's just that they also pull more power uh, in addition to that. I think a lot of people are going to be interested in like power tuning and clock speed optimization, maybe like 
PBO2 undervolts as we've done with the 5000 series. So that's something that I'll probably revisit after this review. Now, as for the test bench, pretty standard stuff. Uh, we've got a 360mm liquid cooler, an RTX 3090, 1000 watt power supply, everything loaded onto NVMe SSDs as well. And for the memory, here's what I've used. So for the DDR4 platforms, I've used 3600 megahertz CL16. And for the new CPUs and the 12900KS, which I've tested, I've used a 6000 megahertz CL30 kit from G-Skill. So then let's finally take a look at the results and let's start off with Cinebench as usual. So all cores and threads here being put to work and we can clearly see how much of a monster that 7950X actually is. It's over 50% faster than the previous gen 5950X and absolutely wipes Intel's fastest CPU at the moment, the 12900KS. The 8 core 7700X is really impressive as well. Multi-threaded and single-threaded scores are a huge jump over previous gen. So that 50% speed up that we see between the 7950X and 5950X, we do see that in Blender as well. So if you do CPU rendering, animation, stuff like that, this chip is incredible if you don't mind the extra power and heat. For renderers that can execute on the GPU instead though, of course that is still the way to go and what I recommend, but hey, some renderers are CPU only. For video exports in DaVinci Resolve Studio, which is what I personally use, there's a bit of time saved, but probably won't make a huge impact unless you're creating massive projects. Uh, and I will note that the new CPUs were actually faster than exporting on the RTX 3090, which was pretty interesting. The next thing that I tested was 3D motion tracking in After Effects. And like a lot of effects, functions and tools in Adobe Suite, this is mostly executed across a single core. Pretty nice speed up though for the new Ryzen CPUs, way more than I was expecting personally. The 7950X completes the task over 30% faster than the 5950X. Even the 8 core 7700X is faster than the juiced up 12900KS from Intel in this particular task. Then for creating video proxies in Adobe Premiere, something that can be done if you're working with like really stubborn codecs and footage and stuff like that, we're looking at massive gains here for Ryzen 7000. If this is part of your workflow, you are saving a serious chunk of time here with these new CPUs. Also again, not a huge jump in performance here between 3rd gen and 4th gen Ryzen, but 5th gen shows an impressive boost. Unfortunately, I can't say the same thing about gaming though. Those huge 30-50% to 50 gains that we just saw in production workloads, they just don't carry over here. Also keep in mind that for CPU game testing, you know, we're testing at 1080p with an RTX 3090 and not even using the highest quality settings most of the time. We're intentionally trying to create a CPU bottleneck to show a difference between these processes, and even still there aren't massive gains. Now sure, if you compare to the 3700X of over 3 years ago, then yeah, you'll get a nice boost boost by upgrading to the new 7700X of today, or you could just upgrade your BIOS, throw in the 5800X 3D, and pretty much get the same results. In fact, the only two games that I saw which really showed a boost with the new CPUs was CSGO and Valorant with low settings with an RTX 3090. And yeah, it's pretty impressive to see almost a 1000 FPS average on the new 7700X in Valorant. Most games though, at realistic quality settings, you know, you're not going to see massive gains over Ryzen 5000 in in general, and especially the 5800X 3D. Now, power consumption during gaming will also be something to consider. It's not too bad, definitely not as bad as what you'll see in Cinebench at full load or anything like that, uh, but especially the 7950X, which has the highest single core boost out of any Ryzen CPU, it just pulls a little bit more than you'd usually expect from a Ryzen chip. The 7700X is a bit tame though, just a few watts over what we normally see. So yeah, when it comes to the multi-threaded workloads, the content creation, uh, uh, even the single threaded stuff like the effects and stuff that can only be done on a single thread uh, these are really killer for that sort of stuff the temperature situation is a bit odd i mean 95 degrees do we really need to put that as the cap i much would rather see the cap at like 85 or even 90 i just think it's a little bit odd to see that squeezed all the way up to 95 degrees i think most people are going to be uncomfortable with that despite it technically being a safe temperature when it comes to gaming though i think most people will be better served if you are currently on the ryzen kind of platform the aim for platform just grab a 5800x 3d if it is available to you and if you can get it at a decent price because when it comes to gaming you're pretty much landing at very similar frame rates especially when you consider you know a more sensible GPU pairing than what we have here and more realistic quality settings. If you are really desperate to upgrade to a new platform, you really want a new motherboard and um, new memory for whatever reason, 
then I still would recommend just holding out if you're primarily interested in gaming because the 3D Vcash chips are not too far away. Probably are the start of next year if the rumors are true. AMD are probably pretty keen to launch those 3D chips uh, after the Intel 13th gen launch. And at the very least, you've got some more options available to you. You can see what the performance looks like there as well. But yeah, exclusively when it comes to gaming, these are a bit hard to recommend. Yeah, they're fast. They're at the top of the chart. I get that. But realistically, they are within single digit percentage points over the current 5800X 3D. And that's not that special. But yeah, let me know what you think of these down below. Let me know what content you want to see on these new chips as well. As always, a huge thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.